Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Internet comment culture invites useless and emotionally charged conflict that accomplishes nothing except to inflame everyone's self-serving sentiments. That's why in Matthew, Jesus refuses to engage in any argument with the Pharisees. To do so, Matthew teaches, is to squander what is holy. In keeping with the teaching of Isaiah, Jesus refuses to quarrel with anyone so that nothing and no one, including Jesus himself, stands out upon the earth except the judgment of his Father, who will not give his glory to another. It is the judgment of the Father that brings divine justice and victory, which Matthew proclaims as hope for the Gentiles. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 14 to 21. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 293 of the Bible as Literature podcast. It's been a few months now, Richard, since we've talked about this beautiful admonition in the Gospel of Matthew that you are not to throw what is holy to the dogs. So many people waste so much time and so much energy, and they spill so much unhelpful emotion in the public discourse because of their lack of wisdom, their inability not to engage in a wasteful discussion. This is so helpful in our age of social media, where responding to people feels so easy. When Jesus was trying to train his disciples, one of the main things is you teach and you move. You don't argue teach and move, and the admonition, as you recall, wasn't that you shouldn't engage with people who aren't worth your time in a way that builds up the ego of the teacher. The admonition was the teacher should not impose their ego on the disciple, that you need to protect what is holy, meaning you are responsible to share the gospel. And if you engage in order to argue, you are no longer sharing the gospel. You are satisfying your own personal motivations, and you are not submitting. And when you don't submit, meaning, as Father Paul might say if you're on the call today, that you don't realize you're a sheep and you have only to say, bah, (laughs) then the Spirit can't work through you. There is a connection here in Matthew, as we get into the discussion of Isaiah this morning, Richard. There's a connection between Jesus not engaging in the argument, meaning not squandering what is holy, and the Spirit then being able to do its work in Jesus. The guest preacher we had last weekend, Father Paul Hodge, made a connection between the lack of faith of the Corinthians and the lack of faith in Matthew in the healing of the paralytic when the disciples are not able to cast out the demons because they lack faith. The problem that is plaguing the people all throughout Matthew is that they're amazed by the healings, but they don't listen to the teaching. Specifically, they don't want to submit to the teaching. In chapter 12 here in Matthew, the tension is between the Pharisees who say, Jesus and his disciples don't submit to the Sabbath, and Jesus saying to the Pharisees, you don't submit to what is written. Jesus used Scripture to make his point, whereas the Pharisees used their own ideas to make their point. If people are amazed by the healing, they're misled. It's the teaching that matters. Now, we're continuing on with this, but as you said, Father, Jesus is done with the Pharisees. They're not interested in listening. They're interested in arguing. So what does Jesus do? He moves. He goes on to the next audience. He's not going to throw the pearls to swine. These people clearly showed that it's not worth 
the time to keep beating this dead horse, to keep trying to teach people who are consciously unwilling to learn. Move to find some other students. Don't waste your time on these students who really don't want to learn. The desecration of what is holy takes place when, as you said, the Pharisees want to talk about their own ideas. That's the tension here. Jesus is not interested in his conflict with the Pharisees. He's interested in what is holy, and that is why he becomes so meek under the control of his father's instruction. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. The one point I want to make here, Richard, is that there's something in this conflict for Jesus. I mean, if someone wants to destroy you, you are incentivized to enter into that conflict and have that argument to defend yourself, to make your point, to try to win over the crowds. Any human being, in verse 14, who has enemies like the Pharisees who are conspiring against him has every right, humanly speaking, and every incentive to squander what is holy and to enter into the arena and have the argument. But Jesus is not going to do that. He's not fleeing. He's not slinking away. He's not trying to escape the Pharisees, worried about the Pharisees, making sure the Pharisees don't hurt him. He's just trying to move away. We had a listener this last week who asked a question. Some editors include verse 14 with the previous section and then put a split between verses 14 and and 15, but we chose to include 14 and 15 because they're a logical continuity. When the Pharisees held counsel against him, Jesus knew it and he withdrew himself and went away. Logically, those should go together. Now, every editor has to make decisions about these sorts of things because there are no paragraphs in the original manuscripts. So you have to decide if you're going to put a paragraph break where you want to put that paragraph break. The chapter headings, the paragraphs, those are as much decisions as the translation decisions that people make when they render Greek into English. Editors always have reasons for making the decisions they make, but whenever they make a decision, it eliminates another possibility. Of course, the text is the controlling factor. The way that we saw the text float, 14 and 15 should go together because it's the Pharisees action, and then Jesus's reaction. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. Now, when we handled the Gospel of Mark, I think we did a thorough and effective job of dismantling and dispelling this silly notion of a messianic secret. Because in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is not the issue. The teaching is the issue. And he asks his disciples to keep quiet because they don't know what they're talking about, because they don't understand his teaching of the crucifixion and the resurrection. They mishear it in a worldly sense. So therefore, he would rather they don't say anything until they understand that the point of the teaching is his destruction. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew here in verse 15 and 16, it's a little different. Jesus doesn't want anyone to know who he was in this context because he is not interested in the debate with the Pharisees. He doesn't want to enter the discussion. That discussion is not the point. He is not there to prove himself. That's not what's at stake. What's at stake, as we'll hear in just a moment, is what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. I mean, this has been going on since the Sermon on the Mount. Any act of righteousness is supposed to be done in secret. If you don't keep it secret, then it becomes about you and no longer about the one who performed the action. Keep it a secret, just like you're supposed to keep your prayers a secret, just like you keep your fasting a secret, just like you keep any act of righteousness a secret. Here's your first charge. If you're healed, then you must keep it a secret. Let's see if you can at least follow this one commandment. Keep your mouth shut. That way, we'll understand if this is about you or if it's about the teaching. Is it about your ego or is it about submitting your ego? Keep it secret for the same reason you kept your prayers secret. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, 
I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Matthew is applying Isaiah chapter 42 to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. And I want to be clear about my statement, because we have to always battle fundamentalism and instead make the effort to submit to what the text is saying and to how the text is laid out. Matthew is not saying that Isaiah predicted Jesus. Matthew is applying Isaiah to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. If you imagine that Isaiah is predicting Jesus, then you will not understand Isaiah chapter 42 when you go back to read it. Matthew is pointing to the title of the chapter, and this is exactly the opposite, Richard, of how people understand the quote in verse 18. They say, oh, he's referring to Isaiah 42. Let's go back and see what Isaiah 42 says about Jesus. No, it's the other way around. Matthew is saying, if you want to understand what I'm doing with Jesus in my gospel, first go back and understand what Isaiah was doing in chapter 42. Yeah, and the issue in Isaiah is bringing the people out of captivity. The first part of Isaiah, the people are in captivity in Babylon, and starting in chapter 40, it's God talking about how he's going to bring them out of captivity in a kind of new exodus, just like he brought the people out of Egypt by making the sea dry. Now God is going to bring the people out of Babylon through the Syrian desert by making the desert damp and dewy. It's a new kind of exodus where he brings them out. In a way, it's like a new Moses, not the same as Moses, but like a new Moses. And Moses is not simply the one who brings them to a new place. He's the one that gives them a law. Jesus is trying to proclaim this law to them. When God is saying, behold, my servant, he says, I'll put my spirit upon him. This reminds me of the baptism where God's spirit goes upon him. In the last section of verse 18, where it says, I will put my spirit upon him, it says, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Now, he just refused to engage with the Pharisees, and that's why in this context, in Matthew, the way that Isaiah is made functional here, God is pleased with Jesus because he's not wasting his time. He's not talking and quarreling with people inside the religious community because it's at this point not helpful at best and jeopardizes the sanctity of what is holy at worst. By arguing with the religious teachers inside the established religious community in Israel, you are squandering what is holy to the dogs. And then at the end of this verse, he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So he's turning his back on the religious insider and now proclaiming justice to the Gentiles. The word in Greek is krisis, decision, judgment, that judgment is the judgment of the Lord which is proclaimed, of course, in Isaiah. This judgment is how the kingdom works. Jesus comes. He says, there is a kingdom, kingdom of God, the kingdom of my father. It's now here. Would you like to be a member of this kingdom? In this kingdom, there'll be peace. You want to join? Let's go. You don't want to join? Fine. I'm moving on. There's going to be a judgment. Who's a member of the kingdom? Who is not a member of the kingdom? You said you didn't want to be a member of the kingdom, so you get to be where you're going to be. Now everyone in the kingdom is in the kingdom. Now it's manifest. That's the judgment. The judgment was already manifest to the Pharisees in the last section. Here's how you do the Sabbath. In the kingdom, it's going to be submitting to what is written. You don't know what is written. You're also not interested in what is written. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to move on. He will not quarrel nor cry out nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Why would they? He's doing what his dad told him to do. There's nothing to talk about. Why would he open his mouth? This is why Jesus is blessed. Because he is behaving as a child, a pais, or a servant, which is, again, difficult for 
Americans to understand that in a Roman household, the child and the servant are the same because that's how Roman welfare worked in the ancient world. But he's not going to quarrel or cry out. He's going to fully submit. He's not going to engage. And that's what makes him powerful through the spirit. He's not going to come down the street with an air horn beating a drum. You have to be ready to listen. A bruised reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice. Again, it's this word, crisis. The choice of justice is an interesting one. I mean, I understand it in the way that we've described it, that it's judgment, which is God's justice, to victory. And obviously, the victory we're talking about is not the kind of victory that Jesus would have acquired had he engaged in a debate with his opponents. It's not that Jesus is a wimp. It's that Jesus is a wimp. (laughs) In other words, the teaching he's carrying is not wimpy. That teaching brings a judgment unto victory, but in order for it to do so, he has to play the wimp. And this actually is exactly what is expected of a Roman patrician in Paul's letters. This is what is expected of Philemon. You are the patrician in your household. It's a Roman station. I'm not going to change it. You're a kind of Abraham in your household. But guess what? I emasculated Abraham, and I'm going to emasculate you, Philemon. You may be the head, but your headship is functional because you are under the authority of the gospel, which means that you have to be the kind of patrician that would not douse a smoldering wick. But at the same time, if the teaching sets out to wipe out all the bruised reeds and to put out all the smoldering wicks, you have to allow it until the Lord, through his instruction, leads judgment unto victory. It's the judgment that leads to victory. You know, the battle hymn to the Republic, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. In this hymn, it says, he has loosed the lightning of his terrible swift sword while truth is marching on. This is what the revolutionaries are singing about their own muskets, as if their muskets are the sword of God's justice. And this is not the case. There is only one weapon that God uses, and that's the teaching. And when this one who bears the Spirit of God teaches, there is no violence other than the words that he proclaims. There is no judgment except the teaching that comes out of his mouth. He is a wimp because we don't understand the power of his word. We only understand the power of the sword or the musket. That is why he looks like a wimp, because you don't know what strength is. You think strength is the sword. You think strength is the gun. Keto onomati aftu ethni epiusin, and in his name, the Gentiles will hope. El piso doesn't exactly mean hope, and it doesn't exactly mean trust, which is how it's translated elsewhere. In the King James, it translates it as trust. But yeah, it's more hope, because hope has a future component to it. When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you hope in that kingdom because it will be manifested fully according to that teaching. If you try to take this word, el piso, in context of nikos din krisin in the previous verse, especially this word krisis, I think an even better translation than hope might be to expect. The Gentiles will have an expectation and anticipation. Obviously, this expectation in principle is a positive one. However, the hope comes from the judgment. And this is so difficult to convey that there is hope in Scripture through judgment. But that judgment for you might not be good news. I want our listeners to really reflect on this. The way God brings hope is through his victory through judgment, and that judgment is always against his addressees. So a Gentile hearing this text in Matthew, the way that it's made functional here, might think, oh, isn't it great that Jesus is turning his back on the Pharisee and now bringing hope to the Gentiles. Well, hold on a minute, because as I said just a moment ago, he emasculated Abraham, 
And then he emasculated Philemon. And what I mean is Philemon as someone who for us in this conversation represents the Roman patrician. And now he's going to emasculate you. You are going to be stripped of your power. And that's how he's going to bring you hope as a Gentile. We trust in this teaching because we hope in the judgment that will judge the mighty. In this way, we can hear this teaching from someone who appears to be a wimp, but who proclaims this teaching with strength, not by wasting his time in stupid arguments, who proclaims it confidently as one given the Spirit from the judge. Had Jesus squandered what is holy in a worldly argument with the Pharisees, he would have made himself the mighty individual whom the judgment is sent to crush. And what's striking always about the New Testament is that even though Jesus submitted, he himself became the one who bore the judgment that the Pharisees deserved, which was destruction. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.